Romans chapter 11, and we're going to be reading from verse number 24 to the very end. Romans 24, sorry, Romans 11, reading from verse number 24. Say, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with, he, with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now, turned, have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so, those also who have now been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed, has committed them, has committed them all to disobedience, that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his path past finding out. For who has known his mind, who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him, and it shall be paid, and it shall be repaid to him. And it shall be repaid, uh, repaid to him. For of him and through him and to him all things are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in the last time we were together, we started reading, we started uh, studying from chapter 11. And we went through verses 1 through all the way to verse number 24. Today, we are going to be covering, completing the remaining part of the chapter. But before we do that, I want to just quickly go over some of the items that we saw Paul emphasize in the first 24 verses of chapter 11. The first thing that we saw that Paul emphasized to us as we studied last time was that God is faithful to Israel. God's faithfulness to Israel. Paul made it very clear that Israel might appear to be in rebellion. Israel might not at this point in time be a part of the body of Christ. They might not have accepted the sacrifice of the Messiah that has come in the midst of them. But the, Paul the Apostle made it very, very clear that God himself is still faithful to his chosen people. Faithful to them not because of what they are doing, but faithful to them because of his promises. Faithful to them because of his promise that he made to the patriarchs. Faithful to them because his words will, he will never go back on his words. So Paul made it very clear. Now that the Gentiles are in the house, now that they have been grafted into the body of Christ, he said, do not ever make that mistake that Israel has been cut off. They might be in a rebellious state right now, but God is still faithful to them because they are the people that he called to himself. Number two, Paul emphasized the fact that God is promise, God's promises to his words. God is faithful to his promises and to his words. In other words, when God makes a promise to you, it doesn't matter how you behave or what you do. You find that God will keep his own end of the bargain. In other words, whatever the Lord Almighty has promised you, things might be going upside down, but God will keep his own end of the bargain. And that's why when he said everybody will be saved, when he said he's going to, you know, anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter how you do it. it but the thing is that as long as you are doing what you said he's going to do, God will keep his own end of the bargain. And Paul the Apostle is making those, uh, he's making his audience to realize. He made it very clear. God is faithful to his, word, his, word, to his promises. When God says, I will never leave you or forsake you, you can take that to the bank. Because he will always be faithful to his words. He said, heaven and earth will pass away. But whatever he has said he will do, he will do it. And that is exactly the same thing that Moses said in the book of Numbers. He said, that God is not a man that he should lie. When he promises you something, he will do it. 
If he has to open the heavens to bring his promises to pass, he will do it. If he has to make the impossible become possible so that his word can be fulfilled, he will do it. So Paul is telling them, number one, God is faithful to Israel because he called them. Number two, he's faithful to his word and his promise. Number three, God's grace is not always going to be available. Paul made that very clear to them. In other words, right now, the grace of God is available to us. And many are taking that grace for granted. Many of us are abusing that particular grace in the way we act towards God and the way we treat his word and the way we respond to him. But Paul the apostle is saying that my spirit, the word of God says, my spirit will not always contend with man. In other words, at one point in time, the spirit of God will say, okay, have your way. Okay, do it the way you want to do it. Okay, enjoy the liberty that you want to enjoy. But at one point in time, the Lord Almighty will hands up. And Paul is trying to let the people know God's grace is available to us now, but God will not continue to pursue. God will not continue to, uh, to indulge our rebelliousness. He will not continue to indulge our sinfulness. God will at one point in time say, I leave you to your own devices. And that is what Paul made these people to understand. And that is what happened to Israel. As much as Israel was misbehaving at several times, at one point in time, God said, okay, fine. You want to behave, you want to misbehave, have your way. Enjoy whatever you want to enjoy. The same thing happened when, the, when Israel was trying to seek a king. The Bible said that the intention of the Almighty God was for the nation of Israel to be what? A nation of kings, a nation of priests that the Lord can speak to directly. At the foot of the Sinai, the Bible makes us to understand that God told Moses, he said, go and prepare the people that I want to speak to them. He gathered everybody together and the Lord started speaking and the guy said, no, 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 this is too much for us. Moses, you have a talent for listening to God. You go listen, you tell us whatever he says. Okay, And the Lord Almighty was still willing to walk with them, was still willing to deal with them. At one point in time, they now said they want to be like other nations. They wanted a king. They think grieved the heart of Samuel. Samuel said, don't do this. Don't do this because this is, what, this is not the intention of God. God said, that's what they want. I'll give it to them. The point we are making is that Paul is reminding the people, the grace of God is available. But the grace of God will not continue to pursue you even in your state of sinfulness and rebelliousness. That means God gives you an opportunity to be able to repent. He gives you an opportunity to be able to clean up your act. He gives us an opportunity to be able to do what we need to do to get right with him. But if we insist, then they will say, well, and that's why Paul the Apostle said, we cannot continue in sin and expect the grace of God to multiply. Because at one point in time, there's a cutoff point. Number four, Paul the Apostle reemphasized the verse of scripture that we learned last time that God keeps a remnant for his own grace. In other words, when the whole world appeared to be going to hell in a ham basket, in a basket or ham, or basket or ham, how do you say, how do they say those things? You know, hand basket. Ha. If they are going to hell in whatever direction that they want to go, if the whole world is upside down, Bible makes us to understand, and Paul made us understand that it is, don't be discouraged. There is always a remnant that God has preserved for himself. There's always a group of people that have not been taken over by the God of this world. When, 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 uh, when Elijah was complaining, yes, I have dealt with the prophets of Baal. I have killed every one of them. And now I am the only one left and they are seeking my life. Paul said, God said, relax, my friend. I know you are very excited about this whole God business. Just relax. I have this whole covered. I have 7,000 people who have not even gone this direction. You think you are the only one left? Don't ever make that mistake. And God, Paul the Apostle is reminding the church. He's saying that Israel might appear as if they are all damned. Israel might appear as if they don't want to have anything to do with God. He said, but it's always a remnant. There is always a group of people that are dedicated to the Almighty God. You may not know them. You may not hear about them, but they are there. And in every station of life, in every walk of life, there are always a remnant that the Lord has kept and preserved for his own glory. And Paul is re-emphasizing and reminding the church that you should take heart for that. And not only God is real, God, and Paul the Apostle is also reminding us that there is nobody who has a monopoly on the knowledge and the grace of God. He was, telling the, he was telling the Gentile Christian, now you are the greatest people in the church right now. You are the largest number within the body of Christ. He said, but do not have that, do not be under any kind of illusion that you have a monopoly on the word of God. That you have a monopoly on the grace of God. The fact that you are saved today does not mean that the guy that is not saved yesterday will never be saved. That is not true. The fact that he is saved today, the fact that you are saved today, and somebody else is still wayward, doesn't mean that that person will never be saved. The fact that you have access to the throne of God, God today, does not mean that you are the one that is controlling it. 
It doesn't mean that you know everything about the things, about, everything about God. You, nobody has a monopoly on the grace of God. Paul the Apostle is reminding them. So in other words, whatever you have learned today, through the grace of God upon your life, others have the grace and the ability to learn the same thing if God decides to give it to them. So keep that in mind. Whatever you have learned, whatever you are enjoying, whatever grace is upon your life, it is not because you are good. It's not because you know how to pray. It's not because you are so special. It's just because of the grace of God upon your life. And Paul reminded them. And then verse number six, Paul also reminded them that there is there's nothing like eternal security. There is nothing like eternal security. If you read verse from verse number 24, Paul the apostle was basically saying that there was a particular, uh, an olive tree, a natural branch of the olive tree. He said, if God can cut off that natural branch and take you, who is a member of a wild olive tree, if the God Almighty can graft you in it, how are you sure that he will not be able to kick you out also? I mean, if they brought you from inside and put you inside the house, what give you the assurance that they are not going to kick you out if you misbehave? So there is nothing like eternal security. That one save, always save. That is nothing. There's nothing like the scripture, the, 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 the consistent teaching of scripture does not support that particular theology. And Paul is making them to understand that. Now that you are in the body of Christ, now that you are saved, make sure you preserve your salvation. Make sure you walk your salvation and keep it. Because you came into the body of Christ through faith. And you are going to remain in the body of Christ through faith. You came into the body of Christ by, by abandoning the things of the old. You are going to remain in the body of Christ by remain, continuously abandoning those things and not bringing those things back again into your life. That's basically what Paul is saying. There is nothing like eternal security. If you think that you are saved, that you are saved forever, you have made a mistake. The same thing he now told them. Then finally, Paul now told them, there is hope for the lost. In other words, those of you who believe that, yes, because somebody is not saved today, they can never be saved. Paul the Apostle said, there's nothing like that. As long as that person is on the face of this earth, as long as that person is still alive and they are not yet dead, there is still hope for that particular individual. Because at one point in time, they might encounter Christ. At one point in time, the grace of God might walk in their heart. At one point in time, the spirit of God might bring a conviction to their soul. And they might turn around and become saved. So just like nobody, when they are saved, they are saved forever. There is nobody who is damned until that person closes their eyes in death. So Paul is trying to make them to understand that you need to understand this basics. And the reason he's telling them is that so that they can begin to comport their lives to show that yes, they are followers of the almighty God. So today, as we begin, as we close out chapter 11, I want us to emphasize, I want us to zero in on the four important points that Paul the Apostle made at, towards the end of this particular chapter. The first one he made, you look at verse number 25. If you have your Bibles, Romans chapter 11, verse number 25, the Bible says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. What mystery is he talking about? He's talking about the mystery of the salvation of Israel. He said, I do not desire that you, brethren, that you be... That you should be ignorant of this mystery. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel. Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come to pass. Paul is basically saying. As believers we need to be informed. About the nature and the character of God. As believers you need to be informed. About the mysteries of how the kingdom of God operates. As a believer, you need to understand the basis of your own salvation and how God deals with the people who are in the kingdom. He's saying that you need to be informed. Why? He said, because if you are not informed, you will find that you will think that you are wise in your own eyes. There are a lot of believers who think that they are wise and they think that they, have an, they are an exception to the rules that God has put in place. That God just looks at them and says, no, you are free to indulge yourself and do whatever. I'll deal with these people. You are one of my favorite guys, so you can misbehave. They just have that idea that they are the exception. There are some believers, because of their ignorance, they are not aware of how the kingdom of God operates. They do not understand how the mysteries of the kingdom relate and reflect in their own life. And that is one thing you find that a lot of Christians, they believe in healing, but they do not believe in healthy living. Many of us believers believe in the miraculous provision, but we do not believe in proper stewardship and management. We expect that the heavens will open and God will throw some Benjamins at us, but we do not understand the process of work and how to invest. 
So at the end of the day, you find out that we see the promise of God, but we don't see the realities of those promises in our lives because we don't understand the principles behind the promises of God. And Paul the Apostle is saying, I don't want you to be ignorant of the mysteries of kingdom because there is a principle upon which God operates. There are certain things how God works. The promises of God says that whatever you lay your hands upon to do shall prosper. Really inherent in that particular promise is a principle of stewardship. When you do what you're supposed to do, then I will bless the work of your hand. If you read the book of Joshua chapter 1, he said, wherever the sole of your feet shall tread upon, he said, I will give it unto you. Inherent in that particular promise is the fact that you have to be engaged with the process. If your leg will not touch anything, don't expect anything. Right. But if you will step on something, whatever you step on, I promise I'm going to give it to you. It's the same thing. Simple mathematics. A million times zero is always zero. It doesn't matter how big the number is. And so Paul is saying, do not be ignorant as to how the kingdom of God operates. Do not be ignorant as to the nature of the Almighty God. Do not be ignorant as to the principles of the Almighty God. Because when you do, you think that you are wise, but you are stupid. You think that you are wise, but you deny yourself of the benefit of the kingdom. You think that you are wise, but you fall into the traps that other people are falling into. And particularly concerning the children of Israel, Paul is telling the Gentiles in the church that don't behave like the Gentiles, don't behave like the children of Israel because they thought that they had the monopoly of the knowledge of God. They thought that they are the special people. They thought that they can live anyhow and the grace of God will continue to multiply. And Paul was telling them, you need to inform, you need to be informed. You need to educate yourself. Understand the mistakes that those people are making so that you don't make the same mistakes. Don't act as if God is like your schoolboy or God is like your buddy and he can do whatever, you can do whatever you want and God with like a Santa Claus, say, oh yeah, boys with a boys and just tolerate you. Say, no, it doesn't work like that. You need to understand the nature of God. You need to understand the character of God. You need to understand how God operates his kingdom. And if you do, you will not become, you know, you will not become, you will not fall into the same trap that other people are falling into. He's saying, educate yourself. Inform yourself about your faith so that way you can get the best out of what God is offering. Number two, Paul is emphasizing, look at verse number 26. The Bible says, I do not desire, I'm reading for 25 again and now I'm reading to 26. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has come in. And so, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away on godliness from Israel. In other words, God has not forgotten his covenants. The fact that people are misbehaving, the fact that people are acting rebellious, does not mean that God has abandoned them. And that is why you and I, we should be very careful what we say about the people of God. Because they might appear as if they are living a rebellious life. But you are not they are God, and they are not answerable to you. Be very careful how you talk about the people of God, especially the people that God has called to be his representative. It doesn't mean that we cannot do critical assessment of an individual. It just means that don't be careful how you run your mouth against the man of God. The Lord is saying that the certainty of Israel. Israel might appear to be rebellious. They might appear to be outside of the will of God, but be very careful because if you think that they are already, they are without hope, you will react to them like that. You will talk about them like that. You will read you relate to them as people without hope. But when you see them that like these are people that God has chosen and God has a plan for their life, you will look at them differently. The same thing. If you look at a church, you look at an individual, you look at a pastor or a leader of the house of God, who you think as is now in an apostate position, he said, if you begin to look at them and see them that God's plan in their life is still in operation, they might be in an apostate situation, but if you treat them, if you see them the way God sees them, it changes the way you behave. It changes the way you relate with them. And Paul is saying, no, that God does not forget his promises concerning an individual. And you need to keep that in mind because it affects the way we relate with people. It affects the way we relate with that little boy or that little girl. You see a rebellious child, you say, oh, I've given up on you. If you don't see them the way God sees them, you will give up on them also. 
For every child that has not yet been born again, or every man that has not been born again, or every wayward daughter or wayward son, if you see them the way God sees them, you know that in the eyes of God, they are still hope. In the eyes of the Almighty God, they can still be saved. In the eyes of the Almighty God, they can still be the next great missionary that the Lord Almighty has proposed to be able to move the nations forward. So be very careful. Keep at the back of your, of your mind that God's promises never fail. And then number three, Paul is emphasizing see, the irrevocability of God's promises. Verse number 29, he said, for the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, God does not go back on his promises. God never goes back on his promises. His relationship, everything that he has said he's going to do, he will do. And then finally, the unsearchable debt and wisdom of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Verse number 33. The Bible says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment and his ways fast, uh, and his ways past finding out. For who has, for who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become, or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given him, given to him, and it shall be repaid to him? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things of whom be glory forever and ever. Paul is basically, you know, Paul is basically saying, don't get cocky with this almighty God. You might, yes, be successful today. Everything might be falling in place for you, but don't forget that this God is still God. Say, so don't fool yourself into believing that you have a corner on the almighty God. Don't be, don't fool yourself into believing that you already know how God operates. I know how God thinks. I know how God does things. God will not do anything without consulting me because I do God a favor by being alive. I know God is God because of me. I mean, if I don't serve him today, he will cease to be God. He said, don't get that idea into your head. You may not be saying that in your word, but that's some of the way we behave. We believe that the church will no longer be the church if we don't show up. We believe the church will no longer move forward if we decide for some reason, I choose not to serve God. And some people will even pray. They say, yes, I told God. You never tell God. Come on. I told God this is what I want. That if he doesn't give it to me, X, Y, and Z, then what is going to happen? What are you going to do? Eh? If God refused to answer your prayer, what are you going to do? Eh? You take it to the night guys in black clothes in D.C. They will become the Supreme Court and judge God. So Paul is saying, keep things in proper perspective. Don't get cocky to think that you have figured out God. And Paul now went on to say, because you don't understand his wisdom. You don't understand his knowledge. They are unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. He said, you cannot do anything apart from him. You cannot move apart from him. If he decides to take your breath, you are done. He said, just understand that so that you can give him the correct glory. You can begin to reverence him. And then he ended up that particular chapter by saying, for of him and through him and to him are all things. I think in the book of Colossians says that all things that are made are made through him. He is the one that spoke the universe into existence. And that's why when some moron says that there is no God, you look at them and say, yes, you are truly a moron. Because if, I mean, let's, no, let's open that chapter. Let's leave that one alone. But the point Paul is making is that God is God. And you need to recognize that in every department of your life. The question is, why is this important? Why is Paul taking the time to do all this? Why is it important for Paul to take the time to admonish his people that they need to be informed? Why is it important for him to remind his audience that they that you know that, that, that Israel will eventually be saved. Why is it important for Paul to remind us that irrevocability of the promise of God? Why is it important for him to tell us that there is unsearchable, there is this unsearchable nature of God that you cannot fully understand Him? There's a mystery around it. Why is it important? Number one, Paul is saying it is important because of our tendencies to become complacent. In other words, as humans, we have that tendency to become complacent. When things are going on very well for us, when we think that we have a level of achievement or a level of success, there is a tendency for us to begin to feel that, yes, we have arrived. And we start letting go of things. And that's why you find that nations don't die when they are in abject poverty. Nations die when they are in serious prosperity. Why? Because of the level of complexity that is associated with human beings. If you look at all the nations that have died, look at them. At the height of their success, that's when they begin to die. And if you look at individuals, when they make the most stupid mistake, is when they think that they have arrived, when they have become very successful. Because you think that, yes, my hands have done all this. And Paul is trying to let us understand that I'm bringing all this thing to your attention because of the nature of our tendencies as humans to become complacent. Number two, Paul is telling us all these things because of our nature. It is the tendency of man to become forgetful. 
The Bible says, woe unto that particular nation that forgets his God. And it's the same thing for the individual. It is important because no condition is permanent. And that's what Paul is trying to let the people understand. Israel might be disobedient today, but they are going to come. You are in the kingdom today, but you may fall. If you don't take time, you may fall out. That particular child might not accept Christ today, but you never know what happens tomorrow. No condition is permanent. Our condition is not always going to be the way it is. The work might not go the way it's going. Family might not be the way you expect it to be. Marriage may not be working out very well right now, but the Lord is saying that, that you do not you know, that the Lord God Almighty is always on the throne. And that if Israel is, the, if the Almighty God still intend to restore Israel, your situation is not irredeemable. That's basically why Paul is saying all these things. Because we tend to forget. When things don't shape the way you want it to go. When the results are not coming as fast as we expect it to go. When things are not falling in place the way we expect it to go, there is a tendency for us to forget. And Paul is writing these things for the church to let them realize. Number one, we have a tendency for complacency. Number two, we have a tendency for forgetfulness. Number three, we have a tendency for degradation. And what do I mean by degradation? Because there's a tendency that when everything is going on very well, we do not pay attention to what we need to pay attention to, and things begin to fall apart. And that is why you see a believer, when they first start as a believer, they are very much on fire for the Lord. They are very much, pray, they are very, very prayerful. They read the word of God. They pray the way they're supposed to pray. But as time goes on, things begin to come, things begin, life begins to happen, and we begin to go, and we begin to give up. We begin to let things go. We begin to let things slide. Life begins to start degrading. Our prayer life begins to degrade. Our reading of the scripture begins to degrade. The doing of the things that we need to do in the house of God begins to degrade. And Paul is saying, you need to remember. You need to remember that you, can, you must always be on the lookout for your life. You must always be on the lookout because of the human tendencies that we have. You must always be on the lookout because God's promises, God's promises are set and they will last. And you, as long as you are willing to pursue it, it will remain in your life. So the tendency for degradation, that's why it's telling us. And then finally, Paul is reminding us because of the tendency for self-importance. Every one of us believe that we are important. Every one of us thinks that we are the best thing that happened after sliced bread. That without us, life will not move forward. Okay, I call it the myth of indispensability. When we believe that we are indispensable. Even in our family, we, feel, we believe that we are indispensable. At the place of work, you think that you are indispensable. And before you know what's happening, you find there's something that we used to say back home in Nigeria. We say that it is the chair that will always end up, that will always succeed. What? The, 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 the employee. Because when you go, the chair will always be there. Somebody else is coming to occupy it. And when you remind yourself that as humans... As humans, that we are dispensable. The only thing that isn't dispensable in our life is the spirit of God that dwells inside of us. He said, when you remember that, it humbles you in the presence of the Almighty God. You know that you are only one, you are only able to do what you are able to do today because of the grace of God. I remember telling people that the people who are in the prison right now because of one particular criminal activity or the other, I am not better, you are not better. The only difference between us and them is the grace of God upon your life. If you take away the grace of God from your life right now, if they take the grace of God out of my life right now, I have the tendency and the ability to do exactly the same thing that those people are doing. It's just the grace of God. That I've been able to take away that sinful nature and taking it out of my life and giving me the grace to be able to obey the word of God. And as long as you continue to remember that, as long as you keep that at the forefront of your mind, you will begin to find out that it's very easy for you to humble yourself in the presence of the Almighty God. Not just that, it is easy for you to be able to relate with other members of your, or other people that you meet. You'll be able to relate to other people's weaknesses. You begin to relate to the other people's, uh, uh, you know, their, 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 their challenges. You begin to understand it better because you know that you are able to stand today, not because of your special ability or anything, but because of the grace of God walking in your life. And that's the reason why Paul told Paul is telling us all this thing. He's telling us all about because of complacency. When you do not pay attention, you become complacent. When you do not constantly remind yourself, you start to forget the greatness of God in your life and the things that he has done in the past. When you do not begin to get yourself involved, you begin to degrade. The things of God in your life begin to degrade. And if you don't take time, you think you are the best thing that ever happened to humanity. And then pride sets in. So this evening, 
Are there areas of our lives where we are becoming complacent? Are there areas of our lives where we are beginning to forget the grace of God upon our lives? Are there areas of our lives where we are beginning to see degradation in our work, in our prayer, in our study, and in our, and our service in the kingdom of God? Are there areas of our lives where we are beginning to feel that, yes, we are the best thing that ever happened, and we are doing God a favor by showing up in church? Are there areas of our lives where we are beginning to think like that? Paul the Apostle says, verse number 17 of Romans chapter 11. If you have your Bible, please open, and that's the last verse we're going to be reading. Verse number 17. The Bible says that if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Verse 18. Do not boast against that particular branch. And if you fast forward to verse number 20, it says, do not be haughty, but fear. Now look at verse number 21. That should make every one of us in this room and all those who are listening to us to pause. Verse 21 says, For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. If God did not spare the natural branches, the ones that he made promises to their fathers, the one who are the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one that he parted the Red Sea for, the one that he sent all the plagues upon Egypt for, the one that he did the miracles and fed for 40 years in the wilderness, if he did not spare them, what gave you the impression that you are going to, if you misbehave, he's just going to look away? He won't. That's what Paul is trying to say. Complacency will be very dangerous for you. Forgetfulness will be dangerous. Degradation will be dangerous and self-importance will be dangerous to your work with God. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.